and uh, our colleagues online. Good afternoon. I don't know whether if you respond to that, we'll be able to hear. My name is Chule uh, at the University of Nairobi, Department of History. Please join me uh, this afternoon to welcome our guests. Dr. Paul Haidt is from the this museum with a very funny name, but he told me to just call it the Archipelago Museum in Denmark. I, I am sure I cannot pronounce that name. Even if I tried, I will not get it right. And Paul is going to be talking to us about landscape archaeology. Actually, his talk is double. So he's going to talk about uh, 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 landscape archaeology, uh, uh, its application in communities, and basically sometimes what we call um, just application of, of this to general life and business and conservation and everything else. Paul holds uh, degrees from the University of York and Harhas. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing that correctly. And uh, the other part of the presentation is going to be about how they practice archaeology in Denmark. So please, uh, uh, let's welcome Paul. Paul Karibusana. Thank you so much. Is this on? Excellent. Well, thank you all very, very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be in a uh, esteemed university talking about archaeology in a quite different part of the world. But uh, as I find it, uh, when we found, find each other together in science, uh, differences doesn't need to be that big. I'm actually going to do it the other way around from uh, what you said just a minute ago, as I'm going to start off with the archaeology in Denmark and uh, move on to landscape archaeology in general. There's a reason for that. I'll come, come back to that in a second. Right. Uh, as you said, uh, my name is Paul Bazerheide. I'm from the Ohaus Museum or Archipelago Museum uh, in Denmark. We have a very, very difficult language. Uh, we are a regional museum and we specialize in landscape archaeology, both in terms of research, in terms of cultural heritage management and in interpretation. I'm going to talk a little bit about all three of those. Right. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, if we could click on to the, to the slide. Excellent. Yes, that one. Great. Now, the first part of my talk is going to be about archaeology in Denmark. And the picture you see here on the slide is a very normal everyday situation in archaeology in Denmark. We use a lot of JCBs, uh, we move a lot of soil, and then we leave a lot of these little yellow sticks here where we uh, find the depositions that we're trying to investigate uh, the other ground. We get back to that in a second. Uh, if we move on to the second slide, I just put together a few facts in Denmark for comparison. And as you can see, it is quite different from Kenya, uh, as we have an area of uh, a little short of 43,000 square kilometers. Uh, we have 7,000 uh, kilometers of coastline. Our very tallest point is Müllehoy at 170 meters above sea level. Yes, I know, it's not a typo. And the average height of elevation above sea level is 34 meters. So we're pretty close to the sea. Uh, and all the wonderful highlands that you have here, we don't really have that. We have a few areas that we call highland, but that's just because we have to make do with what we've got. We have a population of a uh, little short of 6 million people. And if you look at the maps here to the uh, right, you can see that we have Denmark here situated in the uh, sort of the bottom of the Baltic Sea. And this is the way the surface area is used, that we have a lot of farming for fodder for animals, quite a lot of uh, wheat farming. 
Then we have a lot of urban areas. We have a little bit of forest, a little buckland, a little bit of lakes. Uh, so we are very much an agricultural country. Uh, that's what we're working with. And that's obviously also reflected in the archaeology that we do because the areas where we work are agricultural areas. And we have a very long lasting agricultural tradition. This agricultural tradition has often turned our archaeological uh, traces into things that are left below the surface rather than above surface. Right, let's move on to the next slide. This is the timeline we are working with. Yes, again, there are no typos. Our timeline starts uh, by the end of the last ice age, 14,000 years ago. Uh, that's where our archaeology begins. A few very enthusiastic researchers who claim to find uh, Neanderthal traces in Denmark, we don't really see them as far as I can see. So what we have is a long area of Stone Age here, the so-called Nordic Stone Age, where we have the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic. Then we have the Nordic Bronze Age. Uh, we have pre-Roman, Roman, and Germanic Iron Age, Viking Age, very important to us. And then we're moving into the Middle Ages and historical times. The traces that we find are by far most prolific in the Iron Ages. Uh, that's where we have most of our uh, finds, partly due to the way we do archaeology. And the next slide. Thank you. When we do archaeology in Denmark, we do it for three reasons. We do rescue archaeology, which is by a large margin uh, the most, <laughs> most prolific type of archaeology. We do research projects, and then we do a lot of volunteer archaeological work. And the next slide. Rescue archaeology is a really big thing and it's quite different from other countries. So that's why I'm going to spend a few minutes on that. The map you see of Denmark over here is the archaeological units that we have in Denmark. Our archaeological unit is a pink area that we have here, which covers half of the island of Fyren and then the archipelago down here, hence the archipelago museum. Whenever you have a construction process in Denmark, you have to go through a rather elaborate application process. There's going to be considerations for nature, considerations for other construction, and considerations for cultural heritage. If we move on to the next slide, the process looks like this. So you have a request from a contractor, developer. He wants to build whatever, a farm. Uh, it lands on my desk, and then I do a desk-based assessment based on our collective records from what we have uh, in general, and based on what is likely to be found in a particular area of close to freshwater sources or close to the shore. Do we know of existing settlements here? That desk-based assessment leads to a budget for preliminary excavation, which has to be approved by the Agency for Culture and Palaces. It's a very fancy name, palaces. We don't have that many palaces, uh, but I think they like it. Uh, that budget has to be approved because we have monopoly on the archaeological contract work. So in order to protect the developers, they need to approve our budget so we don't just over budget uh, our projects. If the budget is approved, and it is mostly, uh, we go to preliminary excavation. If the preliminary excavation then shows that we have significant archaeological traces in the place, and emphasis on significant. It not, it's not enough that someone has been there sometime in history. There have been people all over the place in history. It has to be a significant uh, cultural remains. Then we go on to making a budget for full archaeological excavation. And that can be a pretty big, big budget, normally around $200,000 uh, for an average excavation. Um, uh, that has to be approved as well. Obviously, again, it's a lot of money for small developers. Uh, for large developers, it doesn't really matter that much, but still has to go through the same process. Um, and then we go on to excavation. That can take, well, a long time, uh, but as short time as possible. As we do have a lot of season in Denmark, uh, right now we have a snowstorm in Denmark. Uh, we can't do that much archaeological work in the winter time, partly because it's all frozen, it's too wet. Uh, and the days are similar to show we can't fit a full day of, day of work into um, excavating there. So um, it does take some time, but we need to place it in the spring, summer, or fall seasons. There are a few exceptions where we need to work very fast, and then we can do it in the winter time, but we try to, to avoid that, uh, partly also because the developers can't really work there. After we have completed the excavation, we go on to carbon dating, microfossils, there's different samples we've taken out. They can take a lot of time, and then we do the final report. So this process here is what we have to go through for every archaeological excavation done in the regime of rescue archaeology. 
And it does seem a little bit uh, rigorous, uh, and particularly if you're sitting actually has to do it. But the good thing is that we get the data from every single development project. We get the chance to evaluate, is there something important here? Is there something we need to excavate? Is there something that we need to take care of? So it also means that we have a substantial archaeological record from all over the country. The bias is obviously that it's not all parts of the country where we have a lot of development. Rural country or rural parts of the country uh, doesn't get a lot of development. If you need to build a large construction, you can just move it and then you're fine for the excavation. So there's a bias uh, placed in that. But still, that's where we get the majority of our uh, data from. Now we've moved on to uh, the research archaeology. And the research archaeology is different in the sense that we obviously need to get funding for that from uh, uh, particularly large funds. We also have some, some money in the departments that we can use ourselves. Um, but it's characterized by few excavations, normally rather small excavations, always rather niche excavations because the bread and butter excavations, we have so many of those, we don't really need to prioritize that. It's when we have a niche that we want to go into. And they're also quite characterized by community involvement. The picture you see here on this slide is from a churchyard uh, that we excavated a few years ago. It's a Catholic church that was uh, founded around 1050 AD and was put out of use on the 17th of February, 1555. And we know that to this degree of certainty because it was ordered by the then king uh, that the church has to be demolished uh, in order to facilitate the neighboring church. Uh, so people had to perish instead. What we want to do in this research project was we want to go and look at the rural populations. We have a lot of urban excavations in Denmark where we have uh, skeletal remains from. It means we have a quite good record of how the people look in the past if they were living in the cities. But what we don't have is a lot of good records for how did people look and live if they live in the countryside, in the farms. Uh, so that's what we wanted to do here, where we knew we had a full medieval uh, cemetery right at hand for us. What we also wanted to do is to look into what happens if you have a church that's been there for 500 years. You have basically the same families who's been living there on and on and on. And then from one day to the, to the other, the church is abandoned. And obviously you can tear down the church, but the burials remain there. And the people are still living in exactly the same uh, farms, the same village, going on the same fields. So how long does it take before you actually forget that there's a church out there where you're children, your family is buried. Uh, and that's what we've been trying to look at here. And it does seem to take a few hundred years before you actually get to that uh, place. And the, and the name actually remains there. All right, let's go to the next slide. We do have some research megatrends uh, in Denmark right now. It's been like this for quite a few years, actually, uh, where Iron Age archaeology is a major player in what we do. And Obviously, Iron Age archaeology is very interesting, uh, but it's also <laughs> it's, it's, it's a major player because most of the data we produce from the rescue archaeology is Iron Age settlements. And when we had a lot of data, it's obviously pretty straightforward to work on that. It's particularly settlement archaeology because, again, what we find are the settlements. It's not as much the burials, the palaces. This is regular everyday settlements. A lot of work being put into that. Then we have Bronze Age archaeology. Bronze Age archaeology has had a good period uh, for almost two decades now, um, based on individuals in the departments uh, who's had a chance to elaborate on that, but also because it's this great topic that's pan-European, so we can work with colleagues across uh, Europe, at least, and the Middle East in order to understand the Bronze Age world. It's also a fascinating world where you have a sort of very picturesque uh, vision of how uh, the world looked uh, with their eyes. Uh, so a lot of work being put into that. And then we have the Vikings. Yes, uh, I'm not sure how much you deal with Vikings down here, uh, but if you're anywhere close to the Northern countries, Vikings is a major thing. And if you could just put Viking anywhere on your application, it's pretty sure to go through. Uh, so that takes up a lot of time. And I did my dissertation on Viking Age archaeology. I like Viking Age, but the, you do get to a point where you sort of think, yeah, well, we do have other periods as well with interesting questions. Um, but it's a major thing. And it's a major thing because in our identity, we do try to sort of gravitate towards the Viking identity, the Vikings coming from this very small country, then uh, expanding all over Europe, all across to North America, to nowadays Russia, to the Mediterranean. Yes, this is 
was supposedly a good time. I don't think it was pretty nice being Viking, actually. Uh, but it uh, fits well into uh, the mental image, self-image of a very small country today. So all things Viking does well. Then we have urbanization. Uh, it's been a major topic for the last decade. Uh, the early urbanization in Denmark takes place around 700, 600 uh, uh, AD. Uh, and that's been a work being done by a few of the early towns and universities. And then we have Neolithic burial customs, uh, whose might seem a, seem a little bit odd why on earth would we focus on that, but it's because we have one of the major monument groups we have in Denmark is Neolithic burials. We have barrows, um, megalithic uh, burials, where we have uh, at present around 4,000 left for so it's probably been three or four thousand times that uh, in the beginning. So it's a very, very prolific monument type that we have all across the country. And still today, it's uh, you see it in all kinds of modern iconography, where it's very, very closely connected to Danish identity. So these Neolithic burials certainly also draw some attention within research. Then we obviously also have a lot of small fields, uh, but these are sort of the mega trends. And move to next, yes. This is becoming a mega trend, and this is because we have some guys like this one here. This is a metal detectorist. I'm not sure if you have metal detectorist here in uh, Kenya. You do? Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of those in Denmark as well. Uh, you can use a metal detector wherever you want. You don't have to apply for license. All you have to do is the things you find, you have to take into a museum who would then evaluate, is this, is this important? Uh, does it need to be kept, or can you get it back? And metal detectors are cheap. Uh, it's very fun, it's very fashionable, there's a lot of treasure hunt mentality going into that. So we have in the vicinity of five, 6,000 metal detectors that we know of in Denmark right now who operate all over the country. And 10, 15 years ago, we would get like 1,000, 2,000 fines in per year. Now we get tens, close to 100,000 fines a year into the museum collections. And imagine being a small museum or even a large museum, and you suddenly get this group where you have thousands of fines you need to process every year, and we don't get additional funding for this. This is just something you have to take out of all the other uh, tasks you have. This is actually, it's a blessing and a curse, um, but uh, we try to embrace it because we get a lot of good data out of the soil here. One of the things that come in is like the little buckle that you have up here. It's an early Viking age buckle um, brooch. Um, and in all its simplicity, it's really important because this is what tells us where we have all the sites that we didn't know before and that we are never going to get to excavate through rescue archaeology. So that's, it's actually a really important contribution to the work we do. Right, let's go on. Now, archaeological training and education, I was guessing was pretty interesting if you're in the university. As a small country, we have two universities who teach archaeology. Uh, that's the universities of Copenhagen and Aarhus, Aarhus where I'm from. Uh, we actually have archaeological periods on the curriculum in primary schools, uh, which is a great aid because what we find is that archaeology does have a certain veneration in the public. People know archaeology, they know to a certain extent, sort of the basic timeline of prehistory. Uh, they can orientate themselves in that. Uh, they've been to museums. They find themselves connected to this. Uh, and often when you tell people, oh, I'm an archaeologist, they say, oh, I wanted to be that too. Then I made a wise choice and became anything else. Uh, but they want to, they, they know archaeology and they find it interesting. We have bachelor's, yeah. master's and PhD programs. PhD programs, not as much as a program as something you do uh, on an individual basis. And we had specific programs for individual periods and areas. So we have nearest archaeology, we have Nordic archaeology, we have uh, quite a few varieties of, of the Nordic archaeologies, and then the departments have specializations. Right now, I think we're in a period of time where we have some challenges in that uh, archaeology is not that prioritized uh, within the departments, so the staff is shrinking, uh, which means the specializations obviously also uh, have to be shrinking a little bit. So something like North Atlantic archaeology, where I'm specialized in, doesn't actually have a chair right now uh, in the universities. Uh, that's the way things are. I'm sure it's the same uh, here and everywhere else. Uh, but these changes do affect the way the archaeological landscape looks uh, in terms of education and training. 
But what we're trying to do in the museums is to always emphasize, trying to get in contact with the schools, trying to build from early on, get this inspiration going, that what we have uh, in our, uh, our countryside and history is really important to the people who live there. Right, next slide. The challenges and opportunities, and this is before we get to the landscape archaeology portion, uh, are what we see here. The economy, obviously a challenge. I think it is to archaeology pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, the economic, economical challenges that we see is that uh, as we are connected, the rescue archaeology is directly connected to the development. If we have a slow period, slow years, where we don't have a lot of development, we have a lot of archaeologists get, going out of work. That's Okay, but being a small country where we only have this many archaeologists, if we have people going out of out of the field, uh, you lose a certain uh, level of ex uh, expertise. We also have shifting attitudes and relevance, and we can see in the periods where things are good, uh, there's a lot a uh, lot of money going around. It's easier to be interested in archaeology than if you have a tight spot. Um, we also have some shifting attitudes towards what is actually important. If we have a lot of development going on, archaeology is obviously an obstacle for that because it costs money to uh, for the developers to uh, pay for the archaeological work, uh, and that can change from time to time. Then we have a rather serious situation about research funding and competition. Again, we only have two universities teaching archaeology, and then the majority of the work is done at the regional museums and the national museum. Those uh, researchers, as myself in the museums and the universities, compete for the same funding, we compete for the same few grants that are to use from, uh, and uh, academia being more and more specialized, more and more professionalized, is a challenge both to them and to us in the museums. Uh, we're just constantly trying to work around how do we actually get, uh, get to collaborate on this, but it is tricky from time to time, and it's also a particularly tricky thing if you have neighboring museums, for example, competing for the same funding, because we could do much better projects together, uh, but there's also a um, bottom line to be met. And then we have the information overload problem, which is actually some of it seems like a luxury problem, uh, but the vast amounts of data that come from the rescue archaeology and from the metal detecturing is actually becoming quite an obstacle because where do you start if you have millions of millions of finds to work with in order to get the sense of now that i've done it right how do you get ahead of that so we're starting to go far more into big data uh, in the way we do our, our archaeology both for the metal uh, finds and from the settlement sites uh, so that's something we're working with it's not necessarily a big problem but it's certainly a challenge that we have to work with uh, for a while uh, forward so that is basically the archaeological landscape of a small country like Denmark. Uh, I think we're quite well funded. Actually, we have great, we have a strong system, we have a strong tradition. We're very fortunate that we have archaeology and history being such an important part of identity. Uh, but we do also have some challenges uh, that is, we have to face uh, in the years to come. And that's going to lead me into the next slide uh, where we're going into my own specialization landscape archaeology in practice and landscape archaeology well let's start with what is landscape archaeology that's okay i'm just teasing you no i'm going to answer it landscape archaeology is where i have colleagues who work with pottery i have uh, colleagues who work with buildings I have, uh, colleagues who work with jewelry i work with landscapes I work with the traces that humans have left in the landscape, and I try to interpret them in the ways that they become meaningful to us in order to understand how did people and nature engage with each other in the past, and how do people engage towards each other in the past. So basically, like every other type of archaeology we do, only the data uh, set here is primarily the, the uh, finds that we do find out in the landscape. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this wonderful picture that we have here is uh, a book of ours by Peter Brueckel. It's from 1550. Uh, it's from um, Belgium, now uh, present day Belgium. And it's one of thousands of pictures like this. It's one of my favorite pictures because it tells you so much about what a landscape is. It's also 500 years old, almost. And it does tell me that people had a certain perspective of landscapes quite a long time ago, far be before we started talking about landscape nature in the way we do today. 
The Book of Hours are meant to be prayer books that you have when you use, and there's a picture for each month, and this picture is obviously called The Harvesters. If some of you are familiar with Tim Ingle's work, you certainly recognize this, as this is one of his favorite uh, pictures in terms of talking about temporality. I'm going to use it to talk a little bit something about something else here. What landscape is and what makes it such a great topic to work with? This is where the sales pitch begins, because I really like some of you to start interesting, getting interested in landscape, maybe start working in it, um, is that landscape is deep, whereas the container is not that deep. It's just a, a figment of time It's right there. But a landscape has been there pretty much forever. It's deep in history. It's also direct. It's something that we engage with directly. We start, we, I look at the window, I see a landscape. Uh, we see in the picture, we see a landscape. It's something that affects us directly, so it's not mediated. It's also uh, democratic, and democratic in the sense that everyone has access to landscape. Everyone, everyone doesn't have direct physical access to all landscapes as in the sense that you can go into them, but you can most normally see them, at least from a distance. Even the hidden city in the Beijing, you can see on pictures, and thus you have access to it. So it becomes something that belongs to all of us in some sense. I think it's a really important point. And then it's delightful. We're going to come back to that as well, because landscapes are nice. This landscape is beautiful. You can see the picture here. Even if this guy has gotten a little bit tired, uh, well, I can sympathize with him. Uh, it's nice. They're having a good time. It's beautiful nature. It's a beautiful countryside. So that's what landscape is. It's one of the reasons why it does really good. I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about uh, the background. What is landscape archaeology? We'll already start on that. I'm going to talk about the research that we can do within landscape archaeology, and I'm going to talk about the outreach potential that is in landscape archaeology, which is really important to a guy like me working in a museum. Right, next slide. Well, we have to start talking about what is a cultural landscape. A cultural landscape, there are pretty much just as many definitions of that as there are archaeologists, geographers, a uh, psychologist, whoever works with landscape, but the way I work with cultural landscape, the school I'm working from, a la cultural landscape consists of two things. One thing is a physical world. It's a world we have around us, we can touch it, we can measure it, we can look at it. It is rise of the soil, of the trees, of the animals, of other humans, of the buildings, whatever we can put into the physical landscapes. That's a very important part of a cultural landscape. But it's not all of the cultural landscape, because the cultural landscape is also what we bring with us ourselves. When we meet a landscape, our predispositions, our understandings, our beliefs, our knowledge becomes part of the cultural landscape. So each of us have actually an individual cultural landscape, which is highly impractical if you want to work with it in research. But fortunately, there are some tendencies towards time and toward in, uh, in certain groups. Uh, what I'm trying to define is uh, what are those traces, what are those trends that far, fall into this sort of, we could call the mental landscape, the things you bring with you when you meet a cultural landscape. When we do find that and use that to understand the approach, the meeting with the physical, that's where we have the cultural landscape. This is where I want to go. All right, the next slide. But let's start with the physical landscape. The physical landscape is something many, many of our colleagues work with a lot uh, in very different kinds of reconstructions. So extremely talented people, all working within what I would call the sciences, the, the science approach to the landscape. I'm going to take only a one a small example here with, uh, with me that I, I worked on a couple of years ago uh, within the field of environmental reconstruction. Environmental reconstruction just means reconstructing the environment. I'm sure you know it. Um, it's utterly important when you work with landscapes because the environment changes. It's changing a lot right now, but it also changed a lot in the past. And not just the environment, also the surface cover, the uh, land use, whatever we have here. This graph that you see over here is a project of a book from the year 2000 by uh, Ringstead. Uh, and what you see is the change in surface cover from around 500 uh, before Christ until 2000. Uh, and you see a lot of changes here. You see an a uh, huge rise in tree cover. You see the expanse of grassland, and then you see gray, grain coming up here, and you have the individual species down here. This reconstruction is based on pollen from lakes, uh, lake uh, palynology, uh, in the town called, or on the area called Guna on the eastern island of Funen, within our uh, area. And 
if you're not into graphs, some people are not, I don't understand them, but they're not. Uh, you can turn that into a nice reconstruction that we have over here. Next slide. Yes. What you can also do in terms of environmental reconstruction, if you don't have a million dollars to do the palynology, is that you can use other sources. And that's what I've been doing here. This area is the same area where you had to church out from before. And what we wanted to do is trying to look back and see the landscape these people lived in in the Middle Ages, where they did their, their uh, churchyard. How did that look? We have cadastral maps from around 1800. And the thing about drainage in Denmark is that it doesn't start until the 1850s. Ah, 1840s, they started really early on. But before that, there was no draining. The landscape back then looked very, very differently than they do today. Today, we have roughly 2% of what we would call wetland in Denmark because wetland is so impractical if you're doing agriculture. But back then we have up to 28% of the countryside being wetland. Some of it being small, large tracts of land, small of it, some of it just being small patches that we have over here. If we look into the cadastral maps, we can see where we have this wetland. Uh, and I know very little about the Kenyan countryside, but I heard that eucalyptus have been introduced in order to combat the wetland situation. Uh, and uh, that seems to be a pretty straightforward to actually getting in to see where do we have the original wetland present uh, in specific places that we uh, compared to what we have today. That's at least what we've been doing here. The reason we wanted to do this is, first of all, to get a sense of how much farmland was actually available. Today, this is all pretty much just farmland. You can take your tracks and drive everywhere you want to. A tractor doesn't go very far in a landscape like this, or a horse and a plow, as it would actually be, or ox and a plow. So we do see these small tracts of land here is actually what they have to make the farming from. This was the livelihood that came from these small patches of land. We do find the names as well. They're called lang air, long fields, and huda, which just means small lumps. What we can also see here is that you cannot really move around in this landscape other than in small certain uh, traces. Um, tracts of land. So if you have to, if you want to go from here to here, you have to act, you actually have to follow a quite narrow path uh, between all these wetland patches. And that's a very different dimension to the landscape as well. So just a very um, simple run of the mill, you can do it in an afternoon reconstruction of an environment like this actually provides a lot of data towards how does this landscape look in the past. Right, let's go to the next one. And how did the landscape look in the past? Now we're moving away from the environmental reconstruction and onto the more sensory reconstructions, which is really the field I'm working in. I'm sure you all know our senses. We have our sight, we have our hearing, we have the sense of touch, we have the taste, sense of smell. We actually also do have what we call the vestibular sense, which is our balance. We have the sense to feel inside ourselves, do our stomachs hurt or whatever. Uh, and we have uh, what you do if you try to close your eyes and then point your finger at your nose. Ta-da! This means eye proprioception. You all have it. Don't worry. Uh, this does it joins communicating with uh, your mind telling you where is my body. If you're an acrobat, this is really, really important. If you're sitting in a chair, chair in an auditory, doesn't really matter that much. But if you're working in a prehistoric sense, in a medieval uh, setting, in a landscape, it is actually quite important. And those sensors can be reconstructed, and that's what we're trying to work with here. We start with the each one, which is the sense of vision. Vision is actually taking a lot of room in archaeological research. I'm sure most of you are, are um, acquainted to this uh, phrase about a dominant position in the landscape, which often means that you're sort of sitting a little bit on top of the surrounding landscape. You have, maybe have some cover in your back, and you can see quite far away. But a dominant position doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, it does if you are a hunter or military person, but a landscape sense does not have dominance. But we do that, get that experience, and it certainly had that back in time. And one of the ways we can go about approach, approach to record this is to do sensory reconstructions and sensory recordings. This map I have out here is a map developed by Hamilton and Whitehouse. And if you've done sensory archaeology before, you'd be familiar with this. It's really very basic and a little bit tricky to work with, but I wanted to take it with you here because one of the many good things I think about landscape archaeology, it is very easy to do and it's very cheap to do. All you need to do is actually try to do it. You can print out this map, very easy. And then we'd stand here in the center. You imagine you're standing there, you have a nice landscape around you, and then you start recording. And what we do with these circles here, um, 
is that you get a sense of what is distant to me and what is close to me. Then you end up with maps like these. In themselves, I don't think they're particularly good to work with, but if you do them on a large number of sites and compare them, you do actually get a quite interesting set of data out of it because you start to get a sense of how are these sites different from each other. So comparatively speaking, this is a very, very easy method to work with. It takes 10, 15 minutes doing a map like this if you're slow. And then all you have to do is to take a camera and do a horizontal photograph around you afterwards as a controlled data sample. Easy peasy. What it also allows you to do is that it allows you to put in small monuments like these. These are cairns. Do you know cairns? Uh, stone cairns? Yeah. Build up structures? Yeah. Something I've been working a lot with in the North Atlantic. And I was just talking about yesterday to my two wonderful children down here. The, phenomenon that if you see a bird outside and want to take a picture of it and then you get to see the picture afterwards and the bird is just like tiny tiny small that's because you don't have the subject emphasis in the photograph but you do get the subject emphasis in a map like this so these cans are tiny 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 because the but because they're important to me and were certainly important to the people in the past you're able to record them with a the way they actually supposed to have in this cultural landscape so very very easy to work with uh, and easy to go about. And uh, if you want to, I would strongly suggest that uh, try this out uh, in a project. Good thing is it doesn't really cost anything apart from a couple of hours of work. Uh, and then you can try it out. Next one. Right. Intervisibility is a well-known phenomenon to work with here. The case I've been taking with, uh, I've taken with you here is just an example of how you can actually use it. Intervisibility is just a matter of can you see from one point to the other, and if you have a large area, then you can possibly map it uh, over uh, this area. These two areas here is from Iceland and from Funen. I've worked both places, and what I wanted to see is if you have a dispersed rural settlements like we have here, this is marginalized in pretty much every sense of the word. Uh, you have a few number of small farms, you see them as the black dots, and here you have the red, red dots. Each of them are single farms, they're not part of the village, but they're part of the community as far as we know. What I wanted to test here is, are they actually connected to each other? And the test is pretty simple. I did an intervisibility test to see, are those connected? You can see the lines here, the farms that you see here connected by lines, are actually visually connected to each other. So they can see each other. There aren't any black lines over here. That's because these farms are not connected to each other. They have the same individual distance. They're found on the very outskirts of Funen. And in this frame of theory, they would be far more marginalized than these ones over here because there's no interconnectedness between these farms over here. Again, it's pretty simple to do this analysis. You can do it digitally, uh, I'll come back to that, or you can do it uh, in the field. I would prefer doing it in the field if you have the luxury of actually going there, uh, but sometimes money can prevent you from going far distant places like this, uh, but they can also do it uh, in a digital way. The thing is just here, see, these farms, they would know if there's a fire, if there's a ship coming, or if there's anything happening here. These farms here do not. Pretty much anything could happen to this farm here, for example, Fiskorp, without anyone to know for days, unless they actually came by him. So intervisibility is just another way of doing landscape analysis on, analysis on a sensory level. All right, let's go to the next slide. So vision, vision is something that most of us are comfortable with because we're working in academia and academia is a very visual world. We do writing on paper, we do pictures, we do screens, we do video. Uh, but we certainly also have an auditory element to uh, the world we live in. Uh, soundscapes can be many things. One of the things it can be is a characterization of a different place. We have an island uh, in the area where, we, where I work that we call Lyrø. And Lyrø is supposed, Lyrø is a derivative of Lyrø, which means sound, so sound island. It's supposed to reflect the waves hitting the shores in this island sitting very exposed. Uh, thus finding its way into the characterization, characterization of a landscape. If you're living in Nairobi, you certainly also have a soundscape here. If you're living uh, in St. Gertz, you have a different soundscape there. So it's just ways of characterizing different places. 
You can do that decoding in a scheme like this over here, but you can also do an individual test to see if you then add cultural sounds to this, how do they work within an environment like this here? And what we did uh, in 2008 in Iceland was to try to make this test here. It actually took quite a while, uh, but what we wanted to see how different cultural sounds travel within this particular landscape. Because again, if you have dispersed settlements where it's far between the farms, or whatever kind of settlement you have, it's pretty important if you can hear each other. Can you hear someone scream, for example, scream for help? Uh, that's really important because if you can, you're connected. If you can't, you're not connected, and then you're alone. We did some tests here with male conversation and female conversation. We did both male and female because the female voice generally travels a little farther than the male voice. Uh, we have male raised voice, female raised voice, song. I had a nice colleague who stands singing all alone Iceland, it's a beautiful moment, particularly for us. Uh, stone on stone, metal on metal, and uh, cries, cries for help, where you really yell at the top of your lungs to see how far does this travel. It gives you a very basic data set. Here we have 345 meters being the furthest distance you can hear whatever's happening in this place. What you can do then is you can take your settlement map, where we have your settlements, and then you can put a circle 345 meters around that, if you're within that, you're within connection of settlement. If you're not, you're not really connected. And then you're alone again in the world. Two very, very different ways of living in a world, this. All right, let's take to the next one. This next slide here is from a project we're doing right now. This project is called uh, Church Bells, uh, something odd in Danish, uh, but it's about church bells. What we want us to see is that we have a, Landscape full of churches that we have in Denmark. Churches were built around 1050 to 1200 AD. And thus, at that point, we had a little above 2000 churches, medieval churches all around Denmark. A church at this time would be a stone structure, lime walls, uh, maybe a red roof, uh, quite visible in the landscape. What you can actually see, well, basically see, it's not the best map, I'm sorry about that, but you can see the pink uh, silhouettes here on the silhouette map. That's a visibility map. That's a use that you have from Carl Church that you have here. We started asking ourselves, my colleague Melis Vakas Jensen and me, well, how about the church bells? Could you actually hear them all over this area? The same farms that you have in the other maps also belongs to this area here. And if you could hear the church bells, you would actually be quite well connected to your parish church, the center of your life. But church bells were used for ringing uh, up the sun and in the evening. They were also used if people died and obviously as a source of signaling if something uh, dangerous happened. So we kind of assumed, everybody assumed that church bells would just be audible, well, pretty much everywhere in the landscape because yeah, it's just sort of a sound that you have all around. But when we actually could, were able to show that even modern bells, like the ones we have in churches yeah, here, boom. including one medieval bell, uh, was not... Uh, audible at all. So if you go to the next slide. So we went out to do a little bit of funny field work in August this year. Uh, here you see one of the church bells, nice big bell around 250 kilos sitting in a shallow tower. But you also see the church of Carb over here. The church tower is the point triangle sticking up there. And then you have a hill right next to it. So there's a position in the landscape that doesn't really facilitate the movement of sound across distance. If we go to the next slide. So we organized uh, getting out, doing recordings, very, very basic recordings. That's a good thing about landscape archaeology. It's quite cheap uh, recording device here. You have the church down here by the manor. The very enthusiastic crew over here. And the next slide. And what we got is a map that you saw before. What we do actually have here is this is the audible distance of the carved church and of the bar church. You can see there's a huge gap here. We cannot hear the church bells. Uh, what's also interesting is that it's very directional. Even if the wind was coming from this direction this day, you would almost never ever get to hear church bell over here. And we can hear that from the population today as well. So they would be disconnected from the church. And being disconnected from the church in medieval times was not really a very great thing. You could obviously still see it. You could see it. It's you're within the viewshed here, but the uh, the nice sound of the church bell would not be for you. Then what we're going to do now is that we're trying to take this and model it back to a past situation. 
as I said, these are modern churches. Well, they're medieval churches, but the the uh, the way the bells uh, hang there are modern. So we're trying to take uh, what we know from records from 1528 about how large were the church bells, and then take that onto the same uh, churches, put it down to the entire errancy. Where do we have uh, church bells being audible, and where do don't we have it? And then we're going to compare that with settlement patterns that we know. But again, this is. I mean, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Most of what we do is, uh, but it's just a matter of taking something into the landscape, uh, in this case, sound. Right, next slide. Okay. Movement analysis and tasks is another very, very fun thing to work with. Uh, do you know tasks Tim Ingalls, very uh, famous theory from the 90s. It's actually been challenged quite a bit since, but I've taken the liberty to just keep on using word, meaning something a little bit different uh, from what he meant by it. But a taskscape just means that if you are a farmer, a hunter, a traveler, whatever you are, are coming into a specific landscape, you'll have a specific way of seeing it because your needs will be different. If you're a tourist or a fisherman, you see different things because what you need to facilitate is something different. And a very nice thing is to try to find a huntsman or a warrior or a fisherman or a traveler, whatever, go into a specific landscape with that, Put yourself next to whatever this person is and trying to hear, what do you see? What do you see in this landscape here? And you does, don't even need to be from the same culture group. It helps, but it's not necessary. As long as you're well acquainted, maybe an expert within this task, you can get a lot of data out of it in order to characterize a specific landscape. One of the things most of these people have in common is that they need movement in order to come get around in the landscape. And the movement analysis comes uh, straight after the task escape analysis and you, what you do is that you ask your uh, informant here we need to go here we need to do this then you go through it and then you record it uh, we can take some quite extensive wonderful maps of uh, a landscape used through the eyes of a task in this way Denmark is a very, very flat landscape, as I said, 34 meters above sea level. We don't really have that many natural obstacles in our landscape, but still you have specialists doing different things here. And just talking to an old farmer, for example, makes, gives you a completely different perspective on this landscape. And it ties a little bit onto the things we're going to talk about in a little bit. Let's go to the next one. Now, this I like. We're going to talk about toponyms place names. You see this place here? You can see how dangerous it looks. It looks nasty, right? Not a place you want to go. Oh, no, no, no. This is dark. Uh, this is called Hell's Cave. Hell's Cave. And I promise you, it's one of the most wonderful places you can find on all of Funen. It's beautiful. You have green forest. You have a babbling brook. You have everything you pretty much want from your landscape around you here, which is also why the uh, National Forest Service put in a campsite here. But Hell's Cave means something very different to the people who gave it the names. What we do have in the same cadastral maps that I talked to you about before, these maps where you do uh, get the, uh, the wetlands from, is so you also have an abundance of place names. The cadastral maps were made to tax, uh, and in order to tax, you needed to be very, very sure that you agreed on which field is which field. So whenever they had a place name on it, they would put it down there because then you could look at the map and say, well, you said this was a long acres. Yes, this is a long acres. But we do also find names like Hell's Cave, the Devil's Bark, um, places, names like that. And this, we don't think they believe either Hell, Devil, or something else lived there. It's just an expression of being very, very far away from the center of your know, society. And what we're trying to do right now, actually, is trying to look into these place names to see if you map those across the area, where do we find the margins of these societies? Again, the names in themselves are quite colorful, uh, sometimes interesting in themselves. But what is really more interesting to me uh, is to find out where did these people find the margins and where did they find the center? And the place names are a great way to go there. Let's go to the next slide. Right, and then we have the community involvement here in the sense of chickens helping out a nice young archeological student uh, trying to excavate uh, pit squares in, uh, in a village. Now, landscape and community involvement sort of ties on very closely to what we talked about before. If you talk to people, if you have your local informant, they have a relationship to a landscape. 
they most probably like it if they live there for a long time, but certainly have an opinion of it. It will not be the same as a guy over there, but it's something that is important to them uh, and they know and they want to talk about. So this is a great gateway into talking about what is the people uh, see here. So we've done quite a few community projects now where we work with landscapes. Uh, we have done in different ways. We have the church build project, we have the place name project. This project here was about trying to figure out the medieval village, which is sort of a staple of our countryside. Where did it come from? Uh, not how did it move around, we know about that, but the village that we see today who is still there, how can we go in and actually do research within the village? Most of what we know about the villages and the landscapes come from the villages who were desolate uh, in the late medieval period. And that's great, but that's kind of trying to understand the living by looking at the dead. Uh, we want to look at the living to see what characterized uh, those villages. And what we could do that is by using square meter pits like the chickens here is trying to help out with. Um, and that gives a lot of community involvement. And apart from actually giving the, the pot shirts that we need for the project, it gives all these levels of information, which brings people to being engaged in the project. And we're working with something that is, again, democratic. As I said, landscapes are democratic. It belongs to all of us. We all have a relationship to it. And that's really great for this. Now we're going to move on. Time is running short now as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about the outreach potential uh, of this. Uh, I'm not sure about how many of you are doing outreach or dissemination, uh, but I find it one of the things that are going to be more and more important in the archeological work that we do. We need to justify ourselves towards the public, towards scarce funding and outreach, quality outreach is just the best and simplest way to do. So this, a uh, just a little bit about who we are. We are the Uhos Museum, Archipelago Museum, uh, and our main object objective is empowering the public by connecting them to the cultural landscape. That's really what we want to do. If we've done that at some point, we've succeeded. Right, next slide. Yes, we are a museum with and without walls. Again, our main objective is this, empowering the public, we do exhibitions, we do installations, and we do activities. What you see here is, for example, an installation in the forest close to Fobor, where we see, um, what do you call that? An elf girl. An elf girl is one of the creatures that we find in our wetland uh, area, which is also why it's important to identify these wetland areas. And uh, this is an outreach project where we put some statues out there and we have some uh, tails being put in, in speakers and they can walk around in the wetland area, this very limited wetland area and try to listen and get a sense of what would those creatures be like. One of those is the elf girl, the other one is a Nixon. We also do other kinds of um, activities. We have some see-through kayaks up here where we're sailing around and our sunken uh, Stone Age sites trying to get a sense of that. One of the reasons is we want to teach people we have a sunken Stone Age landscape right next to you, which is pretty cool. Uh, but we also want to enable people to actually go onto the water. To a lot of people, even in Denmark, where we have so much shoreline, uh, the water is just a nice blue surface that will increase your property price by many factors, uh, but it's pretty much inaccessible. But there are ways to go there. You can go bathing, you can go swimming, you can go diving. You can also, if you're not very comfortable being in water, you could maybe go sailing and see it's actually pretty fun. It's not like it's a core objective for a museum to enable people to go into the water. But if you have a museum who have a large portion of their connect collections being submerged landscapes, it is quite important for us to enable people to go there onto the water. All right, next slide. This is the exhibition uh, that we opened last year. It's received quite a few awards, uh, proud to say. Uh, again, with the same overall objective, empowering people, the public to go into the landscape. The fundamental statistics in this exhibition is intense sensations. It's movement and realistic interaction. We use very strong narratives. We have a playwright, a playwright to help us to produce our text. So instead of me, typing along, uh, we have a playwright writing for us, making it easily accessible to the public. We use easily recognizable land, uh, landscapes, which means that I've been on so many wonderful archaeological excursions standing next to a green field and trying to imagine this wonderful Iron Age palace who was there once uh, uh, a long time ago and now just a plain green field. 
that works for me. It probably also works for you. It doesn't really work well for the public. They need something more tangible, something you can actually see. Okay, this is where the history comes from. This is where we tell a story. Then we use as much real materials as possible. And using real natural material in an exhibition setting is not completely <laughs> uncomplicated. It has, it's actually quite expensive. But we do it uh, because there's a field called sensory psychology, which means that a stone tool works different. A stone stone uh, affects you differently than a plastic stone. Real material does things to us. Uh, it's a completely field in ourselves. And if you look back in history, we can see this sensory uh, psychology being employed over and over again, uh, both in the landscape and in the domestic space. And then we use psychological tests to illustrate involuntary responses to nature. These involuntary responses to nature could be the fact uh, that you find yourself quite happy and content if you are in an open space on a hill. It's what's called the savanna hypothesis. Uh, I was a little bit afraid talking about Savannah hypothesis in Kenya of all places, uh, but I think it's a valid uh, theory and it's valid. Uh, and I think we can help validate it because if you look back at the Bruegel painting, that's where you have the elevated position, fresh water supplies, open land, uh, forestation for uh, food. And you do find the same exact pattern in our Stone Age Burrow Mounds. They're placed just like that. So they repeat a pattern over and over again, telling us how did these people like the landscape to be? What was the ideal landscape for them to be in? This was it. Next slide. And this is what we have here in the Neolithic. This is the exhibition space you see here. We have a build up uh, a barrow, a Neolithic barrow in there. We have real stones. We have the landscape around it being as close to a Stone Age landscape as we can produce. Uh, there are obviously a few challenges in that, but it gets pretty close there. And what we really try is to, to emphasize the sensation that we have in this place. What would this place have been like at the time of construction? And then put a, a, um, <clears throat> a tail on that that uh, tells the same story. Next slide. See, why the hills is a nice place. It's a beautiful place. It's a place of contemplation and ease. The box is quite different. We have a lot of sacrificial box in uh, Denmark, Northern Europe, uh, where people would have sacrificed everything from pottery to actually humans to uh, animals. And what characterizes a box is, well, first of all, most of them are gone today. We already talked about that. We don't have that many boxes left because it's, they've all been drained out. But before 1840s, they would have been a really, really important part of the landscape and a very sensoric potent part of the landscape. If you think about a bogland, what is it? It's hard, it is difficult, it is dangerous. You have to use all your senses to actually get out of them alive. And there's a reason that we have all these supernatural beings being located in the box. It's because it's a place where you're afraid to go. We've done an exhibition here where you have a, a very sort of um, bouncing uh, floor you go around, you actually have to use your sensation in this. Um, we display the things that you find in the box. You have skeletons, you have pots, uh, you have the horse here. Uh, and then we try to draw people's attention towards, well, this was actually a really big part of the landscape. If you want to understand the landscapes of notorious writer Hans Christian Andersen, for example, his landscape was a landscape of box all around. This wetland would be a very, very abundant part of the world he knew and of the Iron Age people, of the Bronze Age people. And the Vikings also, uh, certainly these would all have been very, very closely connected to this Barkland, which is just very, um, not very present today. Next one. The next one here is a really nice one. I like it a lot. Uh, it's about the darkness, landscape of darkness. And being quite far north, we do, uh, darkness is a, a very, uh, we're quite short of that in the summertime, but in the wintertime, we do get a lot of it. And you just have to imagine people before the 1900s were living a lot of their lives in darkness. And today, a lot of people are afraid of the dark. Uh, you have adults, children being afraid of the dark. What we want to show is that even if darkness was very, very prolific back in the days, uh, they were still afraid of the dark because it was filled with things they didn't understand. We have a small amulet in this part of the exhibition here who is uh, evoking God and the saints to protect a girl called Margaretha from the elf king and the elf women. Uh, she was very afraid of those. And her life would have been filled with stories about elf kings and elf women who were lurking in the dark, maybe in the box, uh, being everywhere. 
We combined this with a test done by a researcher at Aarhus University called Mark Anderson, who's a psychologist uh, and a religion, uh, historian of religion, uh, where he's been trying to see where do you get these sort of supernatural sensations from? And what happens is that if you take away a sense, for example, the sight, our brain will automatically fill in what it thinks is there, not what it sees is there, but what it thinks is there. It just takes what is most likely and put it in there. So if you're living in a world with stories where you have the elves and the elf women and the mix, uh, and know, oh, they might be there. If you experience a darkness, you're certainly going to put them in there. We have a test in this part of the exhibition where you're going for a walk in, uh, you put on a goggles and they go for a walk in a dark uh, forest. And it's all natural forest. It's done with a ranger and just have the natural animal sounds in there. And there's a button. In front of you, we have to push the button every time you see a supernatural creature. We have not put any supernatural creatures in there, but if you have people pressing the button up to 25 times within two minutes, which is a direct reflection of, if you're coming from a point where you think, well, I'm living in a very sort of secularized part of a world and I'm sort of a very rational being, but there might be a little part of my brain who thinks there might be something out there that I'm not really sure about what it is, and then if you experience a darkness, you will, you will certainly feel it in there. And this is a simple reason why people do get uh, afraid of the dark, which is very important to understand how do people negotiate the dark. They could not avoid it. They had no light. They had to be in the dark. But one of the coping, mechani coping mechanisms were these amulets that they would use to protect them from the forces of the dark. Next slide. Right. Then we have the green area. Uh, and I had the pleasure to talk a little bit to you about that kind of uh, the green, the, the woodland, the plants, and the importance they have to people here. I think it's it's wonderful to see uh, how they're used here, how important it is. Uh, they've certainly also been that uh, both in history and present day Denmark. We spent a lot of time cultivating plants. Actually, a lot of the plants you have here naturally we have in sort of this edition because it's so cold. Uh, but we put them in our living rooms and spent a lot of time and money having green plants around us. Not because they're edible, not because it smells particularly nice, because they're beautiful, they do good things to us. And that's one of the things that I'm really toiling on in the research I do, that within the last 15 years, neuropsychology has advanced considerably. So we know so much more now about what does nature actually do to our minds, thus our bodies. How do we feel when we experience nature? We also have obviously have all our different approaches we each have our own individual history, our memories, our affections, our dislikes. But in the inner core of us, on the neurophysical level, we react uh, simultaneously uh, and similarly to the way nature affects us. And uh, last slide or next slide? Yeah, perfect. So does uh, doing landscape archaeology in an outreach uh, perspective make sense? Yes, I think it do. Uh, for the public, it makes better, more efficient dissemination. Again, if this was an earthenware pot, I love ceramic pots, don't get me wrong, but a lot of people in the public don't really get them as I do, and you probably do too. Uh, so it's a hard point to start your tale, but if you start in some point where you have that in common, like this is the, our historical landscape, this is where we meet each other, the, pop, the present and the past, it's a good place to start. You're simply better off. Uh, and can put more perspectives on it. Scientifically, you get new angles and collaborations. Obviously, again, it's very sort of versatile. You can have it in almost in relation. And you have these new fields within psychology and religious history that you can put into it and add new value to the data that we have already. So instead of spending enormous amounts of time producing even more data that we do so well already, we can take the data that we have, use it for th something new. An organization for our organization in, in particular, it's been a, it is a strong profile and it links us to both tourism and actually to healthcare because there's a growing awareness of how nature affects us positively. And in the part of in, in Denmark, uh, psychological stress is one of the biggest concerns we have with 20% of the adult population being affected by it. So everything we can do in order to get a little bit better is actually really important. And that's one of the roles we'd like to play as a museum. It's not a traditional role, but it might be a good new role to actually do. Right, for the final slide. Yes. So the new directions within both the archaeology in general and, and the, um, the landscape archaeology in particular is the community. 
engagement level that we have in it. It is so important. It can hardly be overestimated how important it is is going to become for us to engage with the public much more than we've done so before. As, as I said, we have a strong veneration within the general public about how our curl is important, but we also have a little bit of uh, fatigue uh, in that point, and we need to engage more, and the landscape is just the best direct way to approach people. <laughs> then we have in the uh, in Denmark and in the world in particular, we have this new landscape of energy acquisition uh, that is new and something different, and this affects large proportions of the landscape. I saw the wind turbines on Gong Hill a couple of days ago, and they look nice to me. Uh, it's a great way of, of producing energy, but if you have many of them, uh, and we do so in Denmark, and solar farms, for example, it does affect the way the landscape looks, even if it's just a few percent of the landscape. And I'd really like to, to uh, go forward uh, with my colleagues and work on, on that to see how there's a history of that and what's the tradition and what can we use that for in the future. And then we, ha then we have these sensory dimensions of the landscape, which is pretty much there. It's already, it's known uh, stuff. It's research that has been done, just has to be applied to basically all the uh, data that we have um, and that we work with. So with that being said, I think I'll thank you for the good hour, sorry, uh, <laughs> and then ask if I have any questions. Sunny Sana Paul, let's see if we can our uh, uh, University of Nairobi Club. Thank you so much for a very educative uh, presentation and uh, we have uh, people here we have others online uh, but i just wanted to be able to recap this with something that looks like um, a comparison between uh, what we have just learned today about uh, how archaeology is practiced in denmark and some i think we have got quite a number of similarities but also a lot of differences <laughs> there are, there are a lot of differences the landscapes are of course different the methods that you started showing us from the first from the first slide with the dozer I think uh, the only time I've seen that here was at Olokesaile when, when Rick Potts brought a bulldozer to flatten a mountain so that we can be able to see the original landscape of the previous Pali or Olokesaile lake. So, the, so that's quite quite something because ordinarily we are still using shovels and trowels and paintbrushes. But then the nature of archaeology and the archaeology in Denmark is also very different. Here we have uh, a challenge of an archaeology practice that is very colonial in nature. And that colonial aspect of it controls the funding and therefore what you get to go and do. And then we have got a huge span of archaeology compared to you, and you just told us it's just 14,000 after the Holocene. And I was going to ask you, uh, what was happening uh, in Denmark before the Holocene? Uh, for example, we have quite a number of uh, places with a lot of archaeology that goes together with the Neanderthal presence. And that doesn't seem to have happened in Denmark and the surrounding areas. And I was wondering whether that is because of the ice ages and, and, and whether during the interglacial periods they couldn't extend to the sea. Then there are also other differences and similarities. Denmark is very close to the sea, like you told us. You said the highest elevation is what, uh, 34 meters? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 34 meters. That, that's for us here, yeah, we call those ant hills. Because, <laughs> because we have real mountains, uh, you know, we have uh, Kilimanjaro, we have Mount Kenya, we have, we've got quite a number of those. Eh? And so I was wondering, uh, to what extent uh, uh, is Denmark doing this uh, archaeology that is related to the sea, marine archaeology, so to speak? We, we know from uh, the history that we, the little history that we know about uh, Northern Europe, that the Vikings were seafarers. Yeah, and I would have imagined that, of course, they, they used part of that, that, that sea there. So I, I, I would like you to mention something about that. And then you also talked about um, doing research, you need uh, the, the, the first one that you talked about rescue, uh, rescue work, a request from contractors. And I was wondering if the contractors, are the contractors required by law to be able to ask you to come and do rescue work? Uh, we have some things here, I think Gilbert has participated in one of those when we are putting power lines from, uh, we, we, are, we are trying to get power from solar. There's something we call Turkana Solar. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gilbert was part of uh, the people who are doing that assessment, you know. 
And then uh, I also participated in one of those when we were doing the pipeline, the oil pipeline. But it's very, very kidogo, very little part of that, okay? And then uh, I also, okay, then you talked about uh, the, the Iron Age and you are trying, you, you are separating it from the bronze and also the Roman or pre-Roman. I was wondering how far back does the Danish Iron Age go? Yeah? And then, uh, then uh, urbanization and so on. Then you talked about the Neolithic uh, burial clusters. Okay. Then uh, in, uh, in, uh, I'm still on the first part, eh? uh, the practice of archaeology in Denmark. Is archaeology in Denmark a profession? Is it something that somebody wants to go and do because they, you can pay rent, you can have food, you can pay school fees, it can it sustain you? Because that's a challenge that we have in, in most parts of Africa, except maybe Ethiopia and South Africa. And that has got to do with, with which I said earlier, the colonial aspect of it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, how popular is it? So that people want, you know, a parent wants their child to go to school and learn archaeology. Okay. And what is the size of the Danish archaeology community? I mean, how many are you? Because here in Kenya, for example, I, I don't think we can exceed two digits. So, <laughs> and those are in the lower sides of the two digits. And then one of the reasons is because even though we may be many, uh, people just go out to other places, the US, Australia, and so on, and they are doing all kinds of good things, but they don't want to stay here for other reasons that we can talk another time, okay? Um, to what extent is the public knowledgeable about archeology span in general? and also about the archaeology of Denmark. How do they identify with it, okay? Mm -hmm. For example, if you compare that with what is happening in the American Midwest, what they call American bottom archaeology, yeah? You find people doing this archaeology and they are detaching themselves from it because it's not our archaeology, it's not my archaeology. It is somebody else, you know, they, they have funny names like American Indians there. So they say, this is Indian archaeology, it's not my archaeology. So I'm kind of like separated with it. And when you look at what is happening here, we could also say the same thing, because as, as, if you come as far close to the late Stone Age and the Neolithic, you could also argue the same here, because most of the followers you see around here came within the last uh, 1, 1,500 years through things known as Bantu expansion, Nilotic migrations, and so on. So if I go to a place where I have 2,000-year-old site, I could say like, okay, it's here in Kenya in the landscape, but it's not really my archaeology. For example, if I find uh, that kind of thing at the back of my house, whose archaeology is that? Can I tie that with my identity? Because you introduced the aspect of identity. Uh, can I tie it with my grandfathers and so on and so forth? Or how, how am I supposed to be able to relate with that? So um, public perception of, of that. And then opportunities, integration. Although in the last slide, actually, you mentioned in the very last slide about tourism. And I was wondering how, how is Denmark integrating uh, archaeological resources into mainstream living, you know, economics, tourism, uh, religion. Okay, there's a lot of religion there when you talked about the churches and the bells, uh, the 250 kilogram bell. That's a very heavy bell. <laughs> okay. And then uh, things like nationalism. We've seen how, how countries like Israel have used the archaeology to, for, for, for purposes of, shall I call it patriotism? Or is it nationalism? I, I don't even know what it is that the Israelis are doing, but they have really, really used it. And I, I, it has also been used here in Africa. In South Africa, the, 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 the apartheid system used archaeology to deny uh, South Africans independence. The same applied in Zimbabwe when they called them Zimbabwe, the work of the Queen of Sheba. Okay, and it wasn't until I think we were with Gilbert there, we went for the work conference in Cape Town, and it was the first time the Mapungubwe material was shown to public because the upper the system was afraid of anybody knowing that Mapungubwe ever existed. And that's a thousand year old site. Okay, I've mentioned something about the marine archaeology. And then there are also of course, things like uh, the challenges and opportunities. You talked about the economy and attitudes. I think I've already mentioned something about that attitude and the information overload. When you talk about information overload, what, what is overloaded? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I mentioned, did I say something about Neanderthals, why they are missing in Denmark? I think I did. Together with things that, uh, that we are seeing in, kind of in landscapes like um, England, where we have things like the Stone Age, you know, those kinds of things, and others are still coming up there. 
Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. And then the, if I get an opportunity again, now I will talk about, uh, I, will, I will raise a few things about uh, landscape archaeology. So that, that was the first part about the, the practice of archaeology in Denmark. Because he, Paul talked about, actually presented two papers in one. Uh, so um, I'd like to open this uh, to the audience to say whatever you want to say to Paul Gilbert. Thank you, Paul, very much for that lively presentation. Say thank you very much for enabling us to hear something about Denmark. Many of us had not heard about anything about it, but it's good. Uh, I was very happy to hear about rescue archaeology. And uh, I heard you talk a lot about funding. Uh, what can you tell me about the legal framework in the country? Does the government contribute anything in funding? Uh, is there a law which compels developers to ensure that cultural heritage materials, archaeological materials are not destroyed so that it motivates that? Uh, I want you to say something about that. Uh, secondly, I was uh, very fascinated to hear about the bogs. I understand in Jutland, for example, we have so many of that. Uh, we have heard so much about Tolundman, we take them here, <laughs> and so much. Uh, has landscape archaeology helped to shed light about those people, their mysteries about them? How did they die? Was there anything to do with the landscape? Uh, maybe you can shed light on that. And uh, something else I want to say, I heard about Hell's Cave, which brings fond mem memories in your place. For us here, we have Hell's Gate, which brings very bad memories in our place. <laughs> <laughs> in our Hell's Gate, people die when they go there. And that is in Naivasha. But thank you very much, <laughs> David. Asante Sana Gilbert. Yes. Thank you. I have a simple question to Paul, and which is tied to part of what you asked him. Now, Paul, what, what inspired you to take archaeology? And in Africa, we know that much about Western countries. Most of them, they love studying sciences and so on. So what, what inspired you to take archaeology? Then the second question, I'm sure you have been to Kenya maybe for quite some time or a week or two. What can we learn or what can Kenyan archaeologists learn from Denmark? Thank you. Asansana? Yes, Prof. Um, I have a couple of questions. First, thank you for a very uh, exciting presentation. Um, the ease of getting funding, because it looks like um, you can discover as many sites as possible, given that you have the metal detectors and they are, uh, I think, within the purview of the museum. So you're always looking for those particular sites. You have volunteers looking for sites and so on. And therefore, you have uh, lots of sites. Uh, what are the prospects of funding? Um, <clears throat> then uh, the second one is uh, uh, contract rescue uh, archaeological work. And my question is, uh, do the contractors contribute towards the funding of that work? Ordinarily, they should be and they should be compelled in most cases. But uh, what is the situation in Denmark? Then there is community involvement. How do you separate community involvement that we see here with the tourism? Thank you. Asana Sana Prof, can we probably maybe, that, that's a lot of stuff for Paul. Can we first of all deal with those ones first and then we go for round two, Paul? All right, uh, Santa Sana. Uh, wonderful. There's nothing worse than standing up here with no questions at all. Uh, 
uh, but you had plenty. That's great. I'm going to take them as in the order I came here. Uh, and <clears throat> if we start with the uh, with the Holocene, the Pleistocene transition uh, that we had in Denmark, what happened in Denmark is that we had the Visalian ice age, the ice sheets coming from northern Norway and Sweden, covering the entire country of Denmark, apart from the very part western part of Jutland. Uh, so everything was eradicated by then and put on a, under hundreds of meters of soil. So we do have uh, an older history. It's just been uh, moved around and deposited far, far below uh, the soil that we have there. The exceptions is, as I said, the, the very western part of Jutland. We do within the quarter, uh, quarter area have five ice ages that, that we know of. Uh, in between those, and actually what we call an ice age, the Visalian ice age from 135 uh, before to uh, 12,000 before, we only we have large periods of relatively warm uh, eras there, <clears throat> where we do have a few finds from. So we have uh, Dama Dama, the, the Dodia, for example, who comes up and lives there. And we do probably also have Neanderthal there. Uh, the reason we like to talk about the Neanderthals is that it's it's very exotic to us. Uh, we have all the, the uh, late Paleolithic cultures we know of, the Arnsborg, the Hamburg cultures, but the Neanderthals are sort of elusive because they would have been there before the last glaciations. Uh, so if they were there, we'd be very, very unlikely to find them. But you can say that we, if you have the Neanderthals in Central Europe, why bother going all the way as far up as close to the ice as you could? If you could just stay down there where it's nice and warm, you had your caves. Uh, we don't have any mountains in Denmark, for example, so the terrain is just very, very different. Uh, so for all we know, they could have been there, uh, but we don't think they were, I don't think at least. About the sea level rise, that actually connects quite closely to the the, uh, the ice age, because as uh, I said, we do have a large, large portion of marine archaeology. I showed the, the pictures of the sea through kayak. Uh, we do snorkeling uh, excursions as well, where we do so snorkel and see these sunken stone age sites, edible time site, era sites, which are on between uh, half meters and three meters of water. And then we get the older periods further out. What happens is that after the ice age, uh, the, well, the sea level rises, obviously, uh, they, they do come up, but we also have a shift in the baseline of the geology. So the southern part of the country is sinking, and the northern part is rising. Uh, so our part of the country is sinking. So where we find these sites on these one, one to three meters of water in the northern part of Jutland, we find them in the hills. Uh, but we do have, the, and we do a lot of, of marine archaeology on that. Marine archaeology is just ridiculously expensive uh, compared to normal archaeology, so it's not a lot uh, we do on that. Um, a few of you had questions towards the developer funding. I sort of anticipated that because uh, it's a very odd construction that we have, as far as I know. It is so that the process that I showed you before was this rescue archaeology process. The work that is done from the point of the preliminary excavation is paid by the developer, by law. We have a museum law uh, and the chapter eight, uh, which is all the rescue archaeology is done under chapter eight archaeology, uh, requires the developer to pay for this. If it's a small, uh, if it's a private, a small private person, for example, building something, could be a, a small house, addition to a house, he can apply for funding from the, um, from the cultural ministry. Uh, and would probably get that. But for larger developers, they have to pay upfront uh, for the archaeology they do. And that's why we have this uh, protection process where the um, agency has to control our budget. So we just don't just overcharge ridiculously. And there's a lot of awareness towards having similar prices per square meter, for example, when we do the big surface archaeology uh, across the country. Uh, and one of the challenges that I, I pointed towards in the economy, this is also one of the challenges, because not all people, believe it or not, think this is a great system. We think it's a wonderful system. 15 years ago, we had a public fund, and by the time of August, this fund had normally run out, and then there were just no more excavations. This actually allows us to protect all the cultural heritage that we need to do uh, in it. But it's protected by the museum law was managed by the cultural ministry. Um, in terms of the Iron Age, it slips my mind now what you asked uh, about that, but we do have a lot uh, of it. Uh, it's, a, it's a large period. We have a quite large population in Denmark by then we think about. 
one million people living in Denmark in the Iron Age, which is a lot compared uh, to now and to prehistoric periods, it was a very organized time. And it's also a time where you start to see the foundation of the villages, uh, which is sort of the, the staple of the Danish countryside. That's a village uh, which doesn't change up to around 1800. Uh, we have the pre-Roman Iron Age starts around 500 before Christ. Then we have uh, the Roman Iron Age from around Christ to around 500, and then the Germanic Iron Age from 500 to 800, 900,000, depending on where you put the Viking Age in this. Uh, these are quite different periods, actually. We do call them all the Iron Age, but technically we're still living in the Iron Age. Uh, but, uh, but in terms of the cultural uh, connections are very different. We have a strong Roman influence in Denmark. Uh, people in Denmark in the Roman Iron Age were quite well aware of something we're not sure they called it the Roman Empire, but something down south uh, with a lot of nice materials, lots of imports, weapons, jewelry, all the kind of stuff uh, we have there. Then you had a great question about if it's a profession. Uh, <laughs> and why on earth people go to work there? Uh, it is a profession. We are. It's not a protected profession. Everyone can call themselves an archaeologist. Um, my title is museum inspector, uh, which is a sort of senior position within the museum community um uh, and i think we are about 300 archaeological museum inspectors in denmark uh working with us and then we have a lot of uh, archaeologists working on a on less not junior but somewhere between junior and senior level uh from from project to project uh so we have a quite large community uh we do have strong sense of community as well, because we're small enough that most of us know each other, quite a few are married to each other uh, or have been. Um, and uh, this this gives a strong sense of of, um, of connection between them. So we have a lot of seminars and, and uh, so it, it is very much a uh, profession. Uh, to the public, I, one of the uh, questions I've been asked quite a few times is, do you actually get paid to do this? When you're standing next to the JCB with a shovel and it's been raining for six weeks and you're miserable, yes, I do get paid to do this, uh, <laughs> and, and it is certainly a a, a recognized uh, profession. We do have a, a strong Indiana Jones bias. Uh, I think most archaeological communities have that. Uh, we could see in 2008 after the last Indiana Jones movie came out. Uh, applications to university uh, increased uh, because everyone wanted to be Indiana Jones, obviously. Uh, and then they start to see reality who's slightly less adventurous, uh, at least in Denmark, uh, than the life of him. But uh, but it is that. Uh, and it's also, as as I think I said, uh, you do get a lot of, of friends and colleagues, uh, well, mostly friends, obviously, uh, who do meet the fact, oh, you're an archaeologist. I, I really wanted to be that too. But then I decided to do something else, probably better. Uh, but uh, I don't think so. There's the detachment of identity that you touched upon. It's a really important question. Uh, and we could spend a whole day talking about that uh, in terms of the archaeology we do. Um, we have the situation in Denmark where our Stone Age population has been replaced several times. Uh, we have migration in the early Neolithic, we have in migrations in the middle Neolithic, uh, we have migrations in the Bronze Age, we have large migrations in the Iron Age. One of the key characteristics of the Iron Age is that by the collapse of the Roman Empire, it has this vacuum of power where people move around all over Europe, and well, you see it all over the world. But this means that, that the people we study are, are not by any measure our ancestors. Uh, and that's a little bit tricky because to some people, it is quite important. And the community, the metal detecting community, to some of them, and to a, a not a large portion, but, but to some of them, there's this, this nationalist uh, tone within their endeavors. Uh, they want to find their history. They see themselves in the Viking age, finds if they find albeit there are just so little Viking blood left in Denmark because people have moved around since then, but it strongly identify themselves as this sort of warrior, uh, explorer identity, even if they are by no means warrior and explorers uh, themselves. But, but it, is, it is a thing. I think what we're struggling with is actually trying to, to uh, communicate and educate to people that, that when, when, we, uh, when you find a stone axe in the field that we do, 
quite often. Uh, this is the connection you have. With this is that you're you, you're living the same place, you're using the same place. Uh, that's the connection you have, rather than this is one of your ancestors who actually made this and left it here for you. Uh, it's hard for people to get that. The project that I showed you with the chickens, uh, with the chickens is a um, is a, a project where we actually going to see if we have the villages where people have been farming for a long time. They have they had uh, farming careers there, uh, and now these. Uh, this uh, demographic is changing. We don't have a lot of farmers anymore. We have huge farms, not a lot of smallholders. So people living in the villages are now commuters, commuting to the big cities. So their identity and connection to the village is something very different than it was a hundred years ago. So then, when they have to find themselves connected to a place, we have to dig a little bit deeper to find that because it's not the ancestral farm they're working on. Uh, then we have this what is overload question, which is also a great, um, a great question. Uh, the overload for us is that we do get so much data in that we cannot in any foreseeable future actually process it all. Uh, we're just taking in data, which is good uh, because we protect the metal finds, for example, but none of us will ever be able to actually work around all of it. And that's one of the things that we have to deal with is trying to find out is there a point where it doesn't anymore make sense to take in this data, just spending hours and hours and hours and hours and thousands of kronos uh, working through it. Uh, history and economy you asked about uh, is a great question. Uh, history and hence archaeology, history and archaeology, the history of Denmark is a major driver in Danish tourism. Uh, we don't have the same scenic countryside that you have here. We do have beautiful places, absolutely, uh, but it doesn't really compare to what we can see other places. So it's more the history uh, that drives people and we have a few uh, few UNESCO World Heritage Sites that is all, all connected to history. And we also see uh, the museum I'm working at when I started 10 years ago. One of the tasks was to develop a museum who was scientifically sound, interesting, but also had the ability to drive a tourism-based economy in a small, slightly suffering town. Uh, and it has shown to be able to do that. So it's quite closely connected. Uh, but we try to keep an arm's length between the questions and uh, the objectives there. Um, yeah, but you, you asked about the legal framework uh, that we work with. I, th I said already something about it, but it is so that, that all sites are protected. We have a list of types of sites that are protected. We have a national registry that everybody can access. Uh, and in your deed, uh, when you buy property, you'll have listed if you have protected, property, uh, protected monuments on your land. That being said, uh, you can still find uh, particularly large, uh, large landowners who have a more sort of loose connection to those parts of the legal framework and who will gladly plow very close to the uh, Neolithic growth, for example. But, <clears throat> but we have a strong uh, protection. We had a case two years ago where a, um, a large landowner had, had demolished two uh, Neolithic long barrows and was forced to rebuild them. Uh, which is very, 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 very expensive uh, way to do that. But it helped us in sort of the sense of communicating with the public, this is actually real. Uh, this is taken seriously and you will be fined until you rebuild uh, these monuments. Um, but again, the museum law is a general uh, protection for these uh, sites and it's taken quite seriously. The box and wetlands, I'm also very fond of the box and wetlands. I think it's a very, very interesting type of landscape. Um, what we've been able to do, we, we've been working with box, the Toleman, for example, the Carl Bellerman. Uh, these box finds were very, very uh, well known. The Elgin Inge, um, <clears throat> large, large burial sites, sacrificial sites. What we've been able to add uh, in terms of the, the landscape archaeology is, and particularly sensory archaeology, is to go from the point where we just observe, well, we have this type of nature, a bogland, and there are people apparently, for some reason, tend to put all the stuff when they wanted to communicate to another world. So I've actually be able to put some more words and put some dimensions on why is this landscape special? What is special about a bog? Well, it's wet, yes, truly. Uh, and people are afraid of it, but but by going in the sensor direction, we can actually start to see, well, the, the bogs are heavily sensorially potent. Uh, and that's probably one of the reasons it was important uh, because they affect us, they do something to us. 
rather than just being, well, I have to put my sacrificial box somewhere, body somewhere, uh, it might as well be here. So that's one of the things I think we've been able to contribute to that. And the Hell's, uh, Hell's Cave and the Hell's Gate, I'm not very familiar with the Hell's Gate site here, uh, but I can tell you the Hell's Cave uh, site in uh, Funen is uh, by wide stretch the most peaceful site you can ever find uh, here. Uh, I unfortunately did not get your name, uh, but you asked uh, what inspired me to take on archaeology. Mark. 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 <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, for the very personal question, well, uh, I actually started uh, doing medicine. Um, then I found out that was way too insecure and dumb, so I wanted to do something uh, stable and safe, archaeology instead. Um, no. Um, I think, well, I think as archaeologists, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, when we do our work, uh, we do a slightly different things. What I think, what I hope I do when I do archaeology is I'm trying to understand humans on a very, very broad universal scale. I want to understand why humans do as they do, how they did in the past, and uh, how that's represented in uh, the physical world. That's what I want to try to understand. Uh, and that's uh, because it's that's very inspiring to me. Uh, that's really what I want to do. I think people do different things, but to me, that's this human connection, this uh, endeavor to try to understand uh, across continents, uh, race, whatever you want to call it, the ways we react, the ways we respond uh, to things that happen to everybody. I think that's really important. Uh, I think it's an important task for the future as well. Uh, and what what can Kenyan archaeology learn from, from Danish archaeology? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think we have some good systems uh, in place. I think they, they, it's also systems that have taken uh, more than a century to get uh, to the point where we have uh, systems like that. I'm not sure we're going to have those systems uh, many, many years uh, on for now, but I hope so. They're good. Um, I hope, uh, I would hope that uh, the emphasis we put on teaching archaeology and prehistory uh, in uh, grand, uh, early school, uh, preschool, uh, could be something that could be done in more places. I think it's really important. I think the the things we do only thrive when we get the demand from the public and we can tell this all we want to the adults but the children is really where where you get uh, the interest from I've, I've done i've done a lot of teaching in university and and in the museum as well and what you can see if you have small people sort of the uh, age up to seven or eight is that they they're going to find this utterly interesting if you just tell it in this interesting enough way. It could be a pot jet or a stone tool, maybe not a bottle of water, but uh, any object, they'll find that utterly fascinating. The grandparents will too. Uh, the older siblings and the parents, not so much. They are much more uh, occupied with finding themselves within the group they're in, uh, making money, whatever they do. But children and the grandparents, that's a great group to work with. Uh, so if you have the choice, I think that's why I try to put some emphasis on that. Uh, then you had a question about the uh, the funding, and yes, it is um, it is uh, so that the developers have to pay for the excavation and for the afterwork. And what we then have to do, and again, one of the challenges in this information overload situation, that one of the things we have to do is that uh, from the agency we are obliged to produce research that sort of utilizes all this data that comes in. And it's not always that easy because you, you, you know you never get to choose which data you want. You just get someone builds this, building something there and you hope it's something interesting, relevant, and sort of relevant to the body of research that is going on otherwise. Uh, but it's certainly one of the differentiation points between universities and museums and one of the, the challenges that we're facing right now. If you want to have a coherent research across a fairly small community, we need to have a little more liberty to choose where we do our research. I think that's an important point. But I do totally see the logic in that the monies that have been put in from developers should ultimately end up doing more archeological research. It is, is published, uh, but it's a long way there uh, for the contract funding. And then you asked about the relationship between the community engagement and the tourism, uh, which is a good question. I hadn't actually thought about that. Uh, we have not yet tried to have sort of a 
direct tourism evolving around participating in archaeology. What we you do work with the local communities, but what we try to do, uh, I'm kind of thinking as I'm talking here, uh, but uh, what, we, what we are trying to do is uh, to, again, empower the public. And that could be the small villages. We have a lot of very picturesque, very idyllic, small, nice villages who has absolutely no source of income apart from the farming they do and the commuting they do. And they can easily be turned into something that has a history that is worth telling, that brings people to a bed and breakfast. And we want to help that along uh, and uh, maybe take people into that. But rather than me or my colleagues standing on the ground doing the work, we want to help uh, the local community being able to do public archaeology for themselves and taking people into that. So instead of telling my story, they're telling their own story, if that makes sense. Right. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I don't know whether you should take uh, uh, round two and then we go online. Yes, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Paul. I, I, I wanted archaeologists to ask informed questions. And, and when I come in with my ignorant ones, uh, I think you will understand because uh, I'm actually not an archaeologist. But thank you very, very much. Uh, th this is quite an eye opener. And um, one of the lessons, Mark, uh, as I listened to Paul and, and for uh, the archaeologists in the room, uh, museum inspectors. You know, uh, you, you have a profession uh, like that. And uh, it seems like uh, there's something we need to learn that um, um, as a country, we, we need to revise uh, the, 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 the Antiquities Act. And uh, in Nairobi, uh, you know that? The population of your country is less than the population of our capital city, yes, Nairobi, know. and yeah. and you are three uh, three hundred. That's us a good representation. <laughs> so maybe uh, we, we need to uh, advocate um, the 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 change of the Antiquities Act and and include a component uh, which makes it compulsory that uh, if the University of Nairobi has to put up uh, a building like this one. Uh, archaeologists needed to have been involved. There are variables buried in uh, underneath uh, this building that nobody knows about, but are of serious cultural uh, significance. We, we teach archaeology, and we were not involved in trying to understand what was buried underneath uh, uh, this famous University of Nairobi towers. Uh, maybe uh, that is something we can champion. As a, as a side department. We, we don't have to wait until some of us get into politics to do that, uh, perhaps because we will get there ultimately. Um, the, 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 the only thing probably I wanted you to comment on with regard to this uh, poll, uh, how is the, the teaching of archaeology at the university uh, level? Uh, because uh, as a department, um, the, the, the challenge we have had is uh, how, how do we retain the, the attention of uh, 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 students in the discipline of archaeology, which I have always thought is extremely uh, important. And um, the, the dichotomy between creation and evolution, uh, you know, has not helped. Uh, it seems like Kenyans are very religious. Uh, and, and the moment we begin to talk about archaeology, implied in it is evolution, which some uh, 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 staunch, so-called staunch Christians may not uh, welcome. I almost ran into a problem in my own local church here uh, when I taught a student evolution and they, they went out there and said, you know, he, he's, he's promoting evolution instead of creation. And he's telling us that the world is millions of years old when we know from the Bible that it's only 6,000 years old. This guy is not a good Christian. So how do you uh, uh, deal with that in ways that will enable us then uh, uh, promote teaching of archaeology at the university level? Or how have you done it in your country 
uh, that we can actually learn learn from so that we are able to attract as many students as, as we can at different levels, at the bachelor's, master's, and the PhD level. My, my second uh, uh, question is, um, the, the, the debate we have had in this country is really uh, archaeology for what? Uh, there is a school of thought that uh, was led by the legendary uh, uh, Dr. Richard Leakey, mm -hmm. uh, which saw archaeology as a scientific endeavor, uh, which digs into the human past and shows the intricacies of this human past and, and uh, how we can use the knowledge obtained to survive in, in a world faced by challenges like climate change. So for him, archaeology is a scientific uh, uh, endeavor. I had a chance to speak to him a couple of times, and he was not very happy that uh, we are turning archaeology into a cultural endeavor uh, to prove, uh, you know, there's this idea that uh, Africa is the cradle of humanity, uh, and therefore everybody, including Paul here, is African. Uh, you had Professor Lonsdale saying that in our seminar on Mauma, in our conference on Mauma. And, and that gives us some reason to walk around with a bit of a bounce uh, in, in our steps. Um, so, so archaeology for what? Uh, is it uh, for purely scientific reasons to unravel the evolution of society in, over these millions of years? Or it has a cultural component? Because that has been a very divisive debate uh, in in our country here, and I have a feeling that it has affected actually the 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 the, the teaching of archaeology and the growth and development of the discipline uh, it's, it, itself. Some thoughts from you would be very very helpful. Now th th there is a, a question that Malimu uh, 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 Kule alluded to. Uh, Malimu is Swahili for teacher. Mwalim is Swahili for teacher. I said Mwalim Kule. Yeah. Um, uh, th there is a question he alluded to. Uh, in, in, in your presentation, uh, th there is a very clear understanding uh, that landscape archaeology, uh, you know, contributes uh, to some extent in the configuring and reconfiguring of identities. Uh, but what I was thinking is, how does it um, uh, uh, help in configuring and reconfiguring of um, uh, hierarchies of power, uh, both the knowledge and uh, also the way that knowledge is uh, appropriated? Uh, actually, that is what Kule asked, and uh, probably I don't know how this has happened in 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 your country you you might want to make a comment on 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 that and and we will have a lot to uh to to to, to learn thank you very much thank you so much right <clears throat> i'll just make a small note note on the comment about the museum inspectors uh which is a it's not just archaeologists, it's also historians and ethnologists. Everyone who works on a scientific level or in a museum can, can be in this uh, position. We have more in several in each museum who work together, who has this common trait that we do kind of all the types of work that we have in the museum, both the outreach and the research. Uh, but it's a great, it's actually a great system. It doesn't really translate very well into English. We normally Trans translate ourselves into curators, but it's not quite the same. Uh, it's it's more, it's a little more complex uh, than that. Um, <clears throat> but yes, uh, it is a um, the system that we have. The teaching at university level is, as I said, it's done in two universities, two large universities who have long, quite long traditions actually to, to teach archaeology. Some of the smaller sub branches have sort of evolved uh, from that. Uh, and generally speaking, nowadays, uh, and that, that this has changed over the last 10 years, ah, 15 years, is that you teach uh, archaeology as a, a complex subject uh, on a BA level, and then you specialize from that. Uh, so either in historical archaeology, prehistoric archaeology, um, medieval archaeology, um, these branches. Uh, we do have 
quite uh, well-staffed universities uh, as I do with, with the different specialities. There has been a significant professionalization since I uh, studied. I had great teachers, uh, but uh, they, they come from a more sort of diverse background. Uh, for young branches uh, within the teaching now, they are sort of pretty straightforward. Uh, Right now, <clears throat> our teaching is challenged by, by funding in the sense that we have this uh, taximeter system in universities. I'm not sure I have the same here, but different educations, different programs get a certain amount of money per student per year. Uh, is allocated that? And <clears throat> archaeology being a, a fairly practical education where you had a lot of lab laboratory work, you had a lot of field work, gets the same as you do in uh, linguistics, for example. Uh, so they are underfunded uh, in terms of practical work. That's what we can help, for example. So we provide. Similar problem, yeah. I can imagine, yes. Uh, we, we can help in the sense that from, from my museum, for example, I, I try to, to be able to host field schools, for example. So some of the practical work can come and be done by us. And I put in my time uh, for this and a bit of funding from the museum. Um, but it's, it's, it is a challenge. I know mean, my colleagues in the university are quite uh, pressed uh, by this. Um, uh, in terms of attracting students, uh, it's not that, that difficult. We had some of very small years, but now I think we have like 100 students per year in total. Again, small country, small population. Uh, it's fairly a uh, respected uh, way to go. A lot of people drop out during the education, unfortunately. Well, not unfortunately, because we don't have many positions afterwards. Uh, but, but quite a few people drop out uh, and find themselves in other parts of humanities, particularly. It's been in the last five years, we did a new student curriculum five, six years ago, and more emphasis on the sciences has been put in, in terms of giving room to uh, the environmental reconstruction, for example, the methodologies we use there. Which is good. Uh, I think from a employer perspective, it's not that particularly relevant that we have a strong natural scientist archaeologists. We need good generalists to go out and fill in the spaces that we use, and then people can specialize from there. But that's an ongoing debate. It's been going on since well, days of early uh, within this. This uh, dichotomy between creation and evolution is a very interesting uh, topic. I'm so fortunate that we don't have that so present in, in Denmark. It's a very secularized community. Uh, and <clears throat> we don't we, we do see the debate on and off, uh, but not in a sense where we get challenged uh, by it. Uh, we do more get the sort of odd conspiracy theories uh, that we have to face on an ever ever ongoing basis, particularly in the local communities where people have all sorts of odd stories about Atlantis and asteroids and aliens and stuff. And they get, it's very colorful and it's a part of work. We sort of take turns within the department to, uh, to catch up uh, the oddball that comes in. Um, <clears throat> the next question about the archaeology forward or the society forward, that's a, that's a really good one. It's a long, it could be a very long answer uh, to that. Uh, generally speaking, we've shifted from um, <coughs> Um, a more classic way of having universities where the professors would be sort of the core of, of a university uh, to a much more lean type of university now where we do have eyes on the ball in terms of employment after graduation. Uh, it needs to be short. We had a suggestion this year about uh, just shortening our master's programs. I don't think it's going to become reality, but th this is a kind of press pressure we're under. When I studied, uh, people, we didn't really have a, a finished time, a time to be finished. We can just take as many years as we want. Some people have been studying for 20, 25 years, studying, doing lots of other things as well. But they were enrolled in university. Uh, nowadays, you have to be done within five years or you're on a contract. Uh, it's very, very, very tight. And what it does is that it puts uh, some significant challenges to the practical capacities of archaeologists coming out. When I started, we had time to go out doing a bit of contract archaeology, getting a sort of uh, getting a sense of, of the trade there. Uh, people could spend one, two years doing that and then coming back and come out as fairly seasoned archaeologists. Now people come out and they're green. They have no clue of what is going on apart from what has been able to teach them there. And that is a big challenge because, again, in terms of employability, you're not that employable if you have to be taught another one, two years before you actually get in. I mean, it's like doing your 
you know, Tonus as a, a medical student, um, <clears throat> we're not really sort of cope for that when they when they uh, develop a funding for that. But in terms of how it's changed, what is forward with the archaeology, I think back in the days it was very much archaeology forward. It was let's do fine stuff here. We are being pressured to a much much higher degree now in order to we have to be relevant. We have to uh, show, document that what we do is relevant, not just to archaeology. Uh, or history, but also to the public in terms of uh, driving tourism, uh, particularly building communities, that kind of stuff. Um, and <clears throat> then the, the question about landscape archaeology contrib contributing to uh, identities and empowering, um, that is what we're trying to do with the first museum has been such on forward about this is what we want to do with what we do. Uh, we do so because, uh, well, I was the first in the department doing this, uh, and it's a really important uh, task to me. I think it's, it's crucially important that we use the goods we have to empower the people who we serve. Uh, and we see ourselves very much as servants of the public uh, when we do in archaeology in the way we do here. Um, I hope it does so. And one of the key points where we can see that if we if we are able to bring guests into a museum who would not normally go there, I think we're on the right path. Uh, if we get the same people who go to every kind of museum all over the world, not much of a difference, I think. But these are uh, actually people who start seeing coming in here from different social groups, uh, different areas, different age groups. They come into a museum and I mean, if they want it or not, they're going to hear something. And I hope they're going to take away a little bit of that hopefully being just a slight bit empowered. If they take the full package, by all means, go for it. Um, most of them don't, uh, but but that's the way we, we want to do that. So I hope that answers your question. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we're going to, uh, to, I'm sorry. I had to, to run, it's a security issue. Sorry, Paul uh, If you can go to the online audience and see whether, oh, before you go online. Okay. Pamela, Malibu. Um, thank you very much, Paul. Um, it was a nice presentation. I'm not an archaeologist, but uh, I, I want to pretend to have understood something and to have learned something. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, it, it is um, the presentation kind of tells us that what you are doing is very interdisciplinary. So do you work with others who are not archaeologists? Um, because I can see the public is there. I mean, the community, and then you're talking about landscapes and then the archaeology itself. And um, I'm also um, just trying to find out when we talk about reconfiguring identities, is that is this um, Denmark's way of um, building patriotism, especially in the wider Europe? Because now Europe is just one world. Yeah. Um, and, and then, because the work is looks like it's so widespread and involving the public um, to a great extent, this could also be a way of um, making the making the discipline attractive to prospective um, students. Could this be so? Yeah, I, I think I stop there. Yes, to be there. Okay, thank you, Paul, for such a, a wonderful presentation. My name is Tabida. I'm an archaeologist. I have two questions, a very quick one. One question probably I will be coming on board on what the, the chair of the department was asking. At what level is the discipline of archaeology in, introduced in the school curricula? Because when we compare it, maybe in our case in Kenya, you find that the, the term archaeology comes on board when students come at the university level. Maybe in your country, at what level is it introduced? The second question is, what is the level of public awareness 
had participation in archaeological work in Denmark. Okay, thank you. Uh, perhaps uh, Prof, uh, Professor Home, and then Ben, and then we see what is going on online. Mine is very simple. Um, it's about funding for the sake of students who may be interested uh, in pursuing PhDs and masters in Denmark. What are the requirements and what are the funding opportunities? Thank you. Mine is just a comment, uh, Paul. Thank you very much. I came in indeed very late, so I didn't get the the, the presentation from the start. Although I'm an archaeologist. Uh, my question or rather comment is on um, public archaeology, community archaeology. Uh, my understanding of these two terms are different. Uh, because when I look at uh, the slides, I saw the very last of the slides you were showing us. I saw very young children there. And I was wondering whether at that point then is archaeology professional? Uh, do we call that public archaeology or do we call it community archaeology? So where is really the difference? How far does the community go in terms of practicing archeology? span Because my understanding of public archeology span could be different from what community archeology span is. Uh, it's perhaps a comment, a question. I don't know how you answer it, but thank you very much for your presentation. We have learned a lot. Asante, Asante, Asante Ben. Um, ca can we have uh, Paul address those ones? Paul, go ahead. Thank you. Yes, uh, in terms of interdisciplinarity, you're absolutely right. It is a very inter interdisciplinary uh, subject doing landscape archaeology. Um, <clears throat> if I look to England, for example, Scotland in particular, my fellow colleagues over there are mostly geographers uh, specializing in the sciences, uh, doing soil analysis, doing uh, palynology, those, those types of studies. And they're doing just as much landscape archaeology as I am. I'm just from a different uh, tradition where, where we do more of these soil anthropological, social, uh, psychological approaches uh, to it. Um, so uh, we work together across the project. Uh, I think the best practice is one where we kind of work together, all of us, uh, in a broad perspective to get these dimensions because they do interconnect and they're quite important uh, to each other as well. Uh, and uh, we, we try to emphasize that all the time. It's just, it's just more fun, actually, uh, to do it that way. So why not do it the fun way? Um, about building, sorry, about building patriotism, that's a really good question. It's not a thing we are very much concerned with in, in Denmark, uh, building patriotism as such. I think we contribute, well, we, we, we have to, that's in our foundations, uh, that we have to contribute to the development of an identity within the community, but we don't have to uh, forward a particular identity. We have to, to uh, we cannot, but why would we? We, we have to, uh, to promote democracy. We have to promote free thought. We have to promote all those values uh, and show them or the lack of them in history, thus teaching how to become what we do, what, where we are today. Uh, but we actually, it's a really good question because whenever it comes to something where we have a value that we want to present, it gets kind of ticklish. Uh, we quite sort of, we are also we're quite, uh, as, as a, a nation, we're quite inhibited. We don't talk a lot about emotions. We don't show our emotions uh, in the same way as we do in South Europe, uh, for example. So whenever it gets to something where we want to say, this is the right thing, uh, we, we hardly ever go there. Uh, so we want to present the ways and then leave it to the public to interpret. And I hope that answers your question. That's a very good question. Um, you had, Sabina, a question about uh, the, um, the, at what level do we introduce archaeology as a profession? And we do that, if not in preschool, that at least in the very young classes in, in, uh, in school. Uh, that's where people learn what archaeology is. Um, we have uh, the uh, Erdbeer culture, who is the late Mesolithic culture that we have in our area. Uh, it was this hunter gatherers living by the sea right before the Neolithization. That's in the curriculum in the third grade. Uh, and in order to understand that, you have to be taught also how was this knowledge produced. And that's the, the very latest point where children meet the term archaeology. Uh, so we have it very early on, which also means that, that we have. Um, 
a large, going on to a second question, a large awareness in the public of archaeology. We have a lot of archaeological museums, some of them are better than others. Absolutely. Uh, but they all have archaeology and they all have interesting artifacts and stuff and and that kind of things in them. Uh, and we do often get, if we have large, you know, slightly more spectacular excavations, that kind of stuff, it gets in the news and people are excited about it. And then and our prominent archaeologists are, are close to heroes, at least when, <laughs> when the awareness is on it. So, uh, but both, both history actually and archaeology does have that, uh, that sense. We have TV shows featuring archaeology and history and how it's done and how museums work and that kind of stuff. Um, both in terms of, of providing a framework for understanding who we are as a, a country and a nation, but also because it's just, it is pretty fun. I think, I think archaeology is a lot of fun, uh, the whole thing. Uh, and why not give that to the children? Uh, you had a question about funding for, for PhD programs. Uh, we have a few different programs. I was on a four plus four program quite a few years ago. Um, that program is still in, in the work, I think uh, it is. Um, Otherwise, people can get from uh, part funding where you have, you, if you're employed in a museum, for example, you can part fund from university, uh, but you cannot sort of, you still have to be accepted into the program. Uh, you cannot just come with a sack of money and say, I want to write this and have it reviewed. You actually have to be enrolled in the program. And within that you have to do, I'm not sure how it works here, but you have to do a bit of teaching, you have to do a bit of departmental work, all those sort of things that you need to do to, in order to be able to function in a scientific department afterwards. So um, we have good programs. Uh, we have shifting funding, I think, uh, but but uh, we do have uh, funding that you can apply for independently as well. Sorry? Language, language of teaching, yes, um, mostly in Danish, but I think uh, to, uh, we have shifted so much towards English now. So. Anyone who speaks English can come to a Danish university and complete the program there. I think you're actually, I think you're obliged to be able to. So some courses are just taught in English. Uh, and if you if not, you have to be able to follow them to get some help to that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and even, even the programs where you have mixed mixed language. Um, I think in, in archaeology particularly, it's a little bit tricky because, uh, and history as well, because we do, uh, I mean, we, we work with local materials most of the time, and some of the older words don't have a logical English uh, translation to them. So it gets a little tricky here and there, but, uh, but it works. Yeah. And then you had a question about, really good question about the public slash community archaeology or the comment. I think I'm going to treat it as a question, uh, but it's just because it's something that's quite important to us as well. Uh, we've, doing, we've been doing community engaging archaeology for ages, uh, also in, in order to facilitate this awareness. But the, the discrepancy between public slash community archaeology is still something we're trying to figure out where, where is that line between them. It's obviously that we have, we as archaeological professionals have work that we do. If we work on, for example, listed monuments, only we can do work there. Um, it's only professional archaeologists doing the work there. But uh, I think it's it's sort of a, a blurry line between where you have the archaeology being done by the community itself, for example, the metal detectoring. It's quite rare that we facilitate the metal detectoring because, again, we have plenty of it. Uh, and sometimes we then try to help and tell the detectorist, please go over here. We think something's interesting over here. Go home and do this. But they actually do it on their own. Uh, and they quite, they, we have very strong amateur archaeologists uh, who are, are very, very skilled in that respect. And then we have the programs where, as I showed you with the chickens, where we try to engage the public in terms of um, participating in the archaeological process to be able to, to generate the data uh, for themselves. But also, and to, to a great and great degree, to be able to ask them to formulate the questions we want to answer, because we have these questions with us on our own that we think are very important, but they might not always be the same as the public thinks is important. So we want to be able to not share our own questions, but to incorporate the questions from the public as well. And then you sometimes get to those quite curious points where you have some some history that's not exactly history in the fact that it happened, but it's a local tradition or a local name or stuff, and people want to know why it's called that. 
Uh, but then you can take that approach and say, okay, we have this name. This did not happen in history. No trolls lived here, as far as we know. Uh, but what was the reason behind that? Or Beacon Hill is, some, is a name that we find in many, many places, for example. You know, beacons uh, with the light. Uh, that's a place where we find a lot of places. Uh, and to get a dialogue going on, well, how, how can we contribute to this? And what is your approach to this? That's what we try to think of as, as community technology. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I saw a few comments online. Uh, I saw something from Angela Kabiru. Oh, do, do you have anybody online who would like to ask a direct question before we go to the comments? Uh, please uh, raise please, up your uh, hand to be able to see you. I had seen the comments earlier. The announcer by Angela Kabiru. Angela is at the museums and she had responded to say that the Antiquities Act has already been revised. And then Habiba, who is our fourth year student in archaeology, was asking whether the revision has any significant improvements. I, I don't think those are questions for you, <laughs> but they are just those comments. And then uh, we have a comment from Raska in Kiambogo University in Uganda. And then we have a question from Angela at the museums. What is the public perception of archaeology? And I think uh, if I'm not wrong, that has already been answered. Uh, yeah, the others are from Kimutai, who is saying that's a fantastic and wonderful presentation from Paul. Thank you so much. Uh, then uh, from Ocho Pasca, I appreciate your presentation from Professor Paul. Then Isaya. Uh, that's a wonderful presentation. It's, it's that kind of thing. Do you have anything else from the audience? I think actually just about the vision. Okay. About the vision, this is actually a really good question because one of the things that we might think, how, how has our bodies changed uh, over time? And this certainly has changed over time. And I mean, looking at your fantastic National Museum here, we see the whole change of development uh, or evolution. Uh, you see some changes, but within the area of, area of time I work with, which would be the Danish prehistory and on, onwards. Uh, I actually did had some dialogue with our professor at the uh, Copenhagen University, Nils Linnerup, our forensic expert, about how things change. And we talked a lot about how vision particularly changed because our bodies are changing. But what we lack today, uh, when we well look at screens and look at papers um, and get a well, short time, um, <clears throat> was on the other hand, back in the days, probably affected by smoke from houses, lack of, of health. Uh, so as far as we can see, our best guess is that it's actually quite comparable. Um, and it's a really important point too, to watch the whole historic aspect that the processes that we see, the, the, uh, the neurophysical processes are the same. They've not changed. They're not changed for billions of years probably um, because that's the way our body works. That's the most optimal, uh, optimal way our body and mind works together. So there's, there's a good question. Do you have any final? Okay, go ahead, Ben. I, I just want to comment on uh, what I asked eh, on a uh, public archaeology and community archaeology. My comment is that uh, those of us who are still learning archaeology, or those who are uh, in their early ages, we still have to learn deeper to understand really the difference between uh, who is public and who is a community in this case. Even myself, I tend to understand it because I, I have taught it before. And uh, I still revisit when I'm reading, I still go deeper really to get the difference. When we talk of public archaeology and we talk of community archaeology, you know, not everyone really will understand the difference between these two. And therefore, we still need to do further reading. Thank you very much, Paul. It was just a comment. I, I absolutely agree with you. There's one more person here. Okay, let's see. Abiba, uh, that's one of our fourth year students. Abiba is asking, just a small clarification, can the presenter reiterate why the archaeology doesn't go further than the Pleistocene? Yes, archaeology okay. in Denmark does not go further than the Pleistocene. We are not that fortunate. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, I hope you have heard that, Abiba. Uh, they are not that fortunate. Um, no. <laughs> Because the earliest they were occupied was uh, Europe was occupied was uh, by the Neanderthals, and you already said why they couldn't go all the way up to Denmark. They were scared of the ice. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they preferred to stay in mid to Europe because it was warmer. Do you have anything else? Yes, yes, over there. Thank you, Professor Paul, for your presentations. I just have two questions here. Which methodology did you use to assess the archaeological challenges in Denmark? Methodology. Then number two is, what is the interface between the archaeological challenges and, and the landscape archaeology from your topic of study or landscape archaeology of Denmark? Thank you. Could, could you repeat the last question, sorry? What, what is the interface between the archaeological challenges and the landscape archaeology, the interface? Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, so you asked about the, what, what village uh, we used? So, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear. Uh, methods you use in your, to assess the challenges of landscape archaeology. Yes, uh, the interface between between the, the archaeological challenges and the landscape archaeology to, to start off with that. Um, I think what what we see in, in the, if you go to the UK, for example, landscape archaeology is a long standing tradition that's been worked for for. 70, 80 years now as a separate discipline, but it's quite new in Denmark. We are just five archaeologists, I think, who can call ourselves actual everyday landscape archaeologists. Um, so it's a novel approach. Uh, what I think it can do is that it does bridge some of the problems that we have in, in the sort of the, the megadata questions, for example. One of the megadata questions is that we have all these settlements from the Iron Age. And if you just look at post holes, we have seen millions of post holes, literally millions of post holes. And at some point, you, you just can't take them any further. Uh, and then people start to look around the landscape. Every report has something about the landscape. There's some water there and a hill there. Uh, but, but doing landscape archaeology in this way, you can take it further. You can actually use that to apply to the megadata and say, if we have a thousand settlements, how are they different from each other? Just as well as a modern settlement is different from each other, have these slight changing characteristics that enable you to tell this from the other. It's not like you can, I've seen only very, very few cases at least where you can say people moved right here because they wanted some specific sensoric um, experience. And this is always in terms of rituality or high status, but for the everyday life, you still have different places you live. And if you can look and combine with place names, for example, you have a quite, you have a few names where you could get a scent, for example, be the uh, the uh, steering uh, sensory quality. So this is why, how people identify themselves. So in order to get from a perspective where you just see Iron Age all over the place to see, oh, the, we have this kind of life here, this kind of life here, this kind of life here. I think this is where the landscape archaeology gets really relevant. And I think the, the major, uh, quality in landscape archaeology is that it's so accessible to everybody because landscape belongs to all of us, whereas the stuff we put in our museums just belongs to, well, the museum, uh, really. If you go and look through the glass, well, it's in there. I cannot touch it. Landscape, we can touch all of us. Um, right. Does that answer your question? Okay, Asante Sana, I think we had a very fruitful discussion, presentation and discussions today. And I think it is time to end it. So um, once again, Asante Sana, and I'll hand over the mic to Gilbert. Thank you, you can now come and sit. You can now come and sit so that Good afternoon, friends, colleagues, peers, students, 
and even members of the general public who have been watching this online. My name is Gilbert K. Wafula. I'm a lecturer in the Department of History and Archaeology. I teach archaeology and tourism. I would like to thank you, head of department, chair, for giving me this opportunity to give a vote of thanks for this presentation. Foremost, I propose a hearty vote of thanks to our chief guest, all the way from Denmark, Dr. Paul Balza Hayes, for volunteering to give us a talk today, which is part of a series of seminars under the theme Emerging Horizons of Historical and Archaeological Research in Kenya. Thank you very much, sir for your interesting and thought-provoking presentation. You have seen that there, it has provoked a lot of interest. We really appreciate it. Thank you. My gratitude also goes to my colleague and moderator for today's seminar, Mwalimu David Mwanzia Kiole, for making excellent comments that have not only enlivened the discussion, but also made the seminar more meaningful. Thank you, David. Special appreciations go to our head of department, Dr. Kenneth Ombongi, for moral, support and guidance, which has been continuous, especially this semester. I am also very happy to express a vote of thanks to colleagues, our colleagues Pamela, Margaret, my colleagues, Dr. Nyanchoga, Professor Wahome, and all those who are online, especially those from other departments and colleges of the University of Nairobi. Colleagues, thank you very much. Special thanks go to our non-academic members of staff, Mr. Philip Kivati, I think you are here. Thank you very much for the work you have been doing throughout this semester in helping the chair to organize these seminars. Thank you very much, Philip. We also thank your other team, including our secretary, Ms. Christine. Thank her very much for us, together with your other members of staff. I would like to thank the various volunteers who have been running around doing a lot of things. For example, ensuring that the audiovisual equipment work efficiently. Thank you so much. Uh, 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 colleagues. To our wonderful students who have turned up today, some of you are here, some are online. I also want to really appreciate you for your participation. We don't take it for granted. Thank you. I say this last opportunity to thank all those who have directly and indirectly contributed to this seminar organized by our department and made it a reality, including members of the general public who have been following our work very keenly in the recent past. Our goal as a department is not only to produce and share knowledge, but also to make this knowledge relevant in fulfilling societal needs. So members of the general public, we really appreciate engaging with us. Once again, I thank you all for your cordial cooperation. To everyone listening from any part of the world, thank you for taking your time to join us today and for listening to this presentation. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Therefore, thank you. And Paul, we say, take our uh, thanks also and greetings to the people of, Sweden, of uh, Denmark. Even Sweden, I'm saying Sweden because I was there. 
uh, your neighbors, say thank you to them. Also greet your family. I've seen some of them are here, but some are not here, I'm sure. Tell them that the Kenyans have said thank you very much. And the, the University of Nairobi History Department says thank you. Thank you, colleagues and friends. <laughs>